Okay, so a warm welcome. I'm Markus Hanisch from the Center for Rural Development here at the Humboldt University Berlin. Um, we are very, very happy to have you all here. Uh, to my background, I'm a researcher. I have been a researcher for most of the time over the last decades here at Humboldt University. I'm a former participant or a, a, an applicant at least at the Center for Rural Development here. And I happen to be the director of the Center for Rural Development here at Humboldt University. A warm welcome from my side today for the 19th of the discussion days here at Berlin. Um, these discussion days are prepared by a wonderful 58th um, annuary group here at the center of 20 students. Um, we are expecting a lot of guests today. I think in total, we will have 1,400 participants. So this is a novum for us. And I, uh, I think this is due to the digitalization. And another comment up front is that this is going to be an experiment. Uh, we will see how we will cope with technical problems and technical opportunities today. This is a digital version of our annual conference. Okay, let's see what we, how we will handle technology. Let's see what we will get out of it. So this morning we will have to discuss and we are happy to discuss a very important subject. The subject title is from being left behind to becoming agents of change in a global pandemic, the potential of indigenous people's knowledge in managing disasters, very actual subject. Yesterday, we already discussed the perspective of a value chain law and in the morning, we discussed conservation issues in South Sub-Saharan Africa. So very interesting subjects, very interesting audiences. A warm thank you for the Info Institute, the Institute for Ecology and Action Anthropology that supported our organizational group. So thank you so much for your support. And of course, also a great thank you for our panelists who are willing to join us today we have John Carling from the Indigenous Peoples Major Group on the Sustainable Development Goals. And we are happy to welcome Fiore Longo. And yes. So Thank you very much. another thing I should do now, and I'm very happy to do is, I'll, is to mention um, the people that have organized that. And organized is this event by the 58th um, a cohort of students here in the postgraduate program at Humboldt University. And um, we are having by name Paul Schätze, Sabrina Stoffel, Lara Sander, Moritz Rail, Julius Nigriev, Christopher Korb. You've done a great job in the preparation. I'm sure you're going to do a great job in joining us here today. So, and with these words, I'm happy to hand over. Um, to the moderators of this morning session. And uh, I wish us all luck and a very successful, critical and fruitful discussion. So far from my side, Markus Hanisch, director of the seminar. Yes, thank you, Markus, for your welcoming words and also for my part, uh, good morning to everybody. So my name is Lara Sander and I would like to give you now a short introduction into the topic. And for that, um, I'm going to share my screen with you. So just a second. Okay, here we Beautiful. are. So now we can start. So again, today's webinar is called From Being Left Behind to Becoming Agents of Change in a Global Pandemic, the Potential of Indigenous People's Knowledge in Managing Disasters. And I would like to start with some thoughts we should have in mind when talking with and about indigenous peoples and indigenous peoples knowledge. So approximately 370 million indigenous peoples are living in 90 different countries, belonging to 5,000 different groups speaking thousands of languages. So we see here that it is important to recognize the diverse local context in terms of, for example, culture, livelihood, social organization, resource use practices or challenges the groups are facing. So just to name a few sectors. 
And um, there is no common definition on what being indigenous means, but the United Nations Working Group on Indigenous Populations developed a common understanding. And that understanding is based on the following factors. Um, Self-identification as well as recognition by other groups or state authorities as a distinct collectivity. Priority in time with respect to the occupation and use of a specific territory. Voluntary perpetuation of cultural distinctiveness and the experience of marginalization, exclusion and discrimination. And there's also no general definition for what we call indigenous people's knowledge, but it can be understood as foundation of indigenous people's identities, cultural heritage, civilizations, livelihoods, and coping strategies over several centuries. And uh, it can't be understood as a fixed or constant body, but rather as a dynamic process. And the term indigenous knowledge is represented in multiple international agreements, for example, in the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Action Agenda of the Third International Conference on Financing for Development, or in the Paris Agreement. And here it is mentioned with regard to its importance of its preservation and protection, as well as its role for economic well-being, environmental management, or climate change adaptation. And especially in that last context of uh, when I was speaking about climate change, environmental management, Indigenous people's knowledge play a very important role for dealing with hazards and disasters. So where does the hazard and what is a disaster? A hazard is a dangerous event, um, natural, anthropogenic or socio-natural in origin. And it can be, for example, an earthquake, a tsunami, a drought, or like we are facing today, the COVID-19 virus. And a hazard can cause a disaster. A disaster then is a serious disruption of the functioning of a community or society, causing widespread human, material, economic, or environmental losses, which exceed the ability of the affected community or society to cope using its own resources. And disasters have several impacts, especially in lower and lower middle income countries, while social impacts of disasters reinforce inequalities and poverty. So what is then the connection between indigenous peoples and disasters? Indigenous peoples count for 5% of the world population, but for 15% of the world's poor. And therefore they are being seen in this context as vulnerable population, meaning being at high risk for negative effects of, for example, climate change, geographical or environmental factors, or other forms of hazards. And vulnerability refers to the inability to mitigate, prepare, or respond adequately to a hazardous event. So, but on the other side, based on their knowledge and innovative practices, um, indigenous people also offer strategies to absorb, accommodate, adopt to, and recover from effects of a hazard. And that is what is called resilience. So the United Nations Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction is the current global framework to prevent and reduce disasters and aims to reduce vulnerability and to strengthen resilience. And therefore, the framework follows four priorities. And priority number one refers to an understanding of disaster risk. And in this, this context, they say that it's important to ensure the use of traditional indigenous and local knowledge and also the practices as appropriate to complement scientific knowledge in disaster risk assessment and the development and implement implementation of policies, strategies, plans, and programs. So today we are facing the COVID-19 pandemic, but um, to what extent has this pandemic already become a disaster? 
And how does the pandemic affect indigenous communities? How do those communities respond? And what can we learn from those communities in managing disasters? So this we would like to discuss with you today. And here with I am coming to an end and handing over to my colleagues, Paul and Sabrina. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lara, for starting us off with the introduction to the topic. And also thank you very much, Marcus, for your opening remarks. I would like to say welcome to all our listeners and to our experts for the third of this year's uh, SLE Development Policy Discussion Day events in this rather unconventional form via Zoom. Um, we organized this event with Heinrich Böll Stiftung and INFO, which is the Institute of uh, Ecology and Action Anthropology, as Marcus already said. My name is Paul Schütze, and together with Sabrina Stoffel, I will guide you through this webinar. Hi, I'm Sabrina, and welcome, everybody. For the next 90 minutes, we will discuss uh, indigenous peoples, their knowledge, and disaster risk management. We will proceed with uh, three steps. First, we prepared a short video with voices of indigenous peoples and their representatives from around the world. Secondly, we've planned a discussion with our experts uh, around three main topics. First, the general role and situation of indigenous peoples and their knowledge. Second, the current pandemic context, um, which puts another stress factor on indigenous peoples. And third, the question of how can indigenous peoples and their knowledge be included or how can they contribute or how can they even expand international cooperation? Finally, we would like to give our listeners um, the opportunity to ask questions to our experts. And therefore, Moritz Reigel will moderate this. If you have questions during the event, you can use the question and answer function of Zoom to enter your question. Please uh, mention which expert you would like to address so Moritz can address the question to the re relevant expert. You can also upvote other listeners' questions if you like them very much. Um, also, we have a small handout with all of this and even more information. You can download it via the link in the chat. Uh, and finally, we would be very happy about your feedback. And therefore, we would like to ask you for three minutes of your time to fill out our evaluation form. The link for this form is also in the chat. So for now, I would like to hand over to Sabrina who will introduce our experts. Thanks, Paul. Just waiting for the slide. Yeah, I'm very pleased to introduce our guests and experts. First, Fiore Longo. She's a research and advocacy officer at Survival International, the global movement for tribal peoples. She is also the director of Survival International France. As part of her master's degree in cultural anthropology, she carried out fieldwork with the Mapuche indigenous people of Chile. She coordinates survival's conservation campaign and has visited many communities in Africa and Asia that face human rights abuses in the name of conservation. She has also visited indigenous communities in Colombia and works on survival's uncontacted tribes campaign. Fiore, it's a pleasure to have you here with us today. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me too. Our second guest is Joan Carling. She's an indigenous activist from the Cordillera Philippines. She studied sociology and economics at the University of the Philippines. She has been working on indigenous issues at the grassroots to international levels for more than 20 years. Ms. Carling worked with indigenous organizations in the Philippines and led the Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact at its set, sec, sorry, Secretary General. Ms. Carling was an expert member of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. She received the Champions of the Earth Lifetime Achievement Award from the United Nations Environment in 2018. Currently, she is the co-convener of the Indigenous Peoples Major Group for Sustainable Development and works directly with Indigenous organizations and networks across the globe. Joan, we are also very excited to welcome you here to this event and please imagine a big applause to you now. Thank you, thank you. 
let's see, since we do not want to talk about indigenous peoples, but with indigenous peoples and their representatives, we conducted various interviews to understand their perspectives. Based on these interviews, we derive our questions for the discussion and our interview partners all cooperate closely with Info. They implement projects in their respective communities that are intended to contribute to the Agenda 2030 and thus to the Sustainable Development Goals. In the following, we will show you a short video that presents our interview partners, their work and problems they are dealing with and struggling with. Let's show the video. Namaskar, Mirunam Pasandulma Sirpa, who Mirogor Udepuzilla Mapodosa, Himali, Basi, Sirpa Sirpa Dati de Moporto Podosu, Mirusa Mudaima, Sirpa, Nepati de Vasa, Bulini Gorinsa, Adibasi Zanzati, Onusandanta Tapikas Kendra, Cypriot Mabodosu, Mirusan Stade, Adibasi Zanzati Hogli, Akno Prompraco Gian, Asip, Obia, Saskiti, Marfot, Sosan Gode Aiko, Practic Sur Southern, Samundi, Odian Onusandan, Procussion, Gode Akosa, Rayo Sangos, Sansangi, Prompragot, Jibiko Parzan, Goni Kamhuru, Marimari Pupeni Pulamien. Incheta Mapuche Meu Pedro Coña Canillan Pingay Rulo Mapu Chile Pingay Incheni Tugun Inchin Mapuche Mapuche significa gente de la tierra Nuestra cultura a través de los años este, ha convivido con la naturaleza y ha estado ligada a ella de ella eh, salen nuestros alimentos. Nuestra cultura también ha desarrollado métodos interesantes para mejorar nuestra alimentación. Por ello quiero hablar del funanpoñi, que es un método ancestral de la cultura mapuche para preparar eh, la papa. Bueno, el funanpoñi ha permitido aumentar la diversidad de alimentos de consumo y la nutrición eh, de los miembros de la comunidad. El desarrollo del método del Funan Pony de alguna manera ha demostrado o, o demuestra en, actualmente el nivel de conocimiento profundo y acumulado, digamos, del manejo de la biodiversidad y su protección. Desafortunadamente, el proceso de la modernidad ha impactado negativamente al Funan Pony, ya que el estilo de vida actual por decirlo de algún modo, ha, ha influido en olvidar el método de, de preparación o los lugares donde se, se realizan, su valor nutricional. Eh, han puesto de alguna manera en riesgo la continuidad de, de esta ancestral alternativa de consumo de la papa. Eh, Funan Poñi representa en sí un, miles de años de de desarrollo adaptativo de la cultura mapuche en plena convivencia y en balance con la naturaleza. So my name is Rodion Solizka and I'm originally from the Russian tradition from the eastern Siberia and I'm indigenous person my people name is Udege. Yeah, Udege means in my native language forest people. It means we are forest dependent people because we are living in in taiga part of the boreal forest ecosystem. So, and of course, uh, it's quite rich uh, nature in terms of biodiversity, and we are still keeping our traditional lifestyle based on hunting, uh, fisheries, and uh, wild plants in the desert. Mata Raha Kro Longoli, Simon Peter Apollo Chubakori, a Karikoni ka pizangna anke yokok be Karamoja Development Forum Almortane Pianege kitiana ti Karamoja ndadang a ra Karamoja Development Forum a pizingna e bogongna anke yokok na itiai kotere aktopedor anke yokok kuriana kena pedor 
na peroto que já curia na crona na tapito na lupa na crona na tapito a choc na crona na tapito a equipe que é a lotou a macar mojão encontrei o ano encar mojão na dan a pei milhão na minha ngarei no oi tu o senhor tu a doa a querida a tamam no oi encontrei na tua a morte a equipe a morte a ninha encontrei a barrio encontrei tu neta a ngai o coto a mamu é guri guri Makrono go rucoka na nawe kama krono na sustainable development goals, epe kilimakini kan, una baadhi una baadhi makrono na lodikini karamaja development forum, ito gongiarit atamam, ito gongiarit emore kuri akuriarit, borongulu anki yoko alato ama karimaja ngi kesingulu. Well, as we have just seen in the video and heard in the introduction, indigenous self-identification cannot be generalized as it is very diverse around the world. Therefore, I would love to start the dialogue with our experts now. Indigenous communities have always been facing their own socioeconomic, political, ecological and health threats beyond, even beyond the pandemic. So, John and Fiore. I would like to ask you for an opening statement by giving examples of your work regarding indigenous peoples and vulnerabilities they are witness, witnessing. Joan, please start. Yeah, um, uh, well, thank you. I, I just would like to take off from the earlier presentation on indigenous peoples because I, I think we need to also recognize the, the distinctness of, of in, in indigenous peoples uh, that also uh, are, is a, are key factors in their vulnerabilities, but at the same time in relation to their contributions uh, and, and building their resilience, contributions to development and building their resilience. So if, if we look at historically, uh, we know that in, in indigenous uh, peoples have uh, resisted the subjugation and colonization, and they have, and we have our own uh, political and economic system and, and governance system that is very much tied to our lands and resources. And thereby our identities, our spiritualities, our knowledge uh, is derived from that reciprocal relations and interdependence that we have with our environment and different ecosystems because we live in different ecosystems as you have uh, you said, and it, it, it showed in the uh, earlier interview, some are in the forest, some in savanna, some are in the mountains. So we, we need to acknowledge that, that we are in different ecosystems. And in, in, in that sense, um, uh, our knowledge are built from our, our centuries of interactions with that kind of, of ecosystems and thereby building and coping uh, building our knowledge and our coping mechanisms uh, in changes that are happening in that uh, kind of uh, ecosystems. But uh, going to now, what, what are the vulnerabilities that we see? Uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, it, the, the hazards become uh, disasters when it becomes unmanageable. And in the recent past, we've seen already the fire, fires that are happening across Australia, uh, the tsunami that are happening ac across the Caribbean islands where a um, massive number of indigenous peoples are affected, but also the whole environment uh, getting affected. Uh, floods uh, from, from, from uh, uh, typhoons and where I come from, that is uh, a, a big issue and, and leading to disasters. But I, I want to emphasize that uh, the, the, the thing that is worsening these disasters are also the destruction of the ecosystems that we rely on. And that, that is caused by land grabbing, severe pollution, the, the unsustainable development practices that is happening, that is losing to deforestation, for example, illegal logging or commercial logging. Then we also, uh, uh, so, so these are, 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 are factors that are, are caused by humans. Uh, that is uh, making it more difficult for us to respond to this kind of uh, disasters. So just want to end with that. Mm -hmm. All right. Fiore, um, what are your thoughts for the opening statement? Yes, so um, actually we, we are talking about vulnerabilities um, linked to indigenous people, but I would like to point out 
uh, that really the main vulner vulnerability they are facing is linked to the vulnerability that we as a Western industrialized society have, which is, uh, so and, and that is linked to the work <clears throat> of survival. We are not representing indigenous people. We are um, trying to change uh, the public opinion radically, the Western public opinion, uh, because um, what we, what we <clears throat> indigenous people are facing now is uh, what we call structural racism. And, and that is not uh, a structural vulnerability of indigenous people. It's something that we build as society and we create, we consider them primitives and brutal savage. Um, and uh, what um, the industrialized society has done in, in because um, we, we uh, see them as primitive is uh, still in their land or imposed uh, development or what we call development actually, imposed schooling, imposed or vision of the world. And, and that is uh, by now, and we believe this in survival, the main threat uh, to indigenous people today is actually the way we see them. That is why we are trying, we as Western society, we are trying to change that. Um, the, um, the, the, the second thing, uh, other than structural racism and discrimination, for us, uh, as Joan was saying, is land theft. Um, so uh, the land of indigenous people are being stolen or invaded by miners, loggers, yes, so uh, in the name of profit, but not only. Uh, we have the problem also of conservationists, so their land are being stolen in the name of conservation to create national parks, for example. Uh, they're being invaded by missionaries, for example, also in the name of religion. Uh, so they are facing all this kind of, of, of invasion and land theft. And it's very important to understand that for uh, indigenous people, the land is not just the, the, something that gives them food or housing or medicine or clothing. Uh, but it's part of the sense of who they are. Uh, it's part of their identity. So um, st stealing their land could mean also um, genocide, it could mean the end of the existence of these people as people. And another of the, and, and the last thing um, uh, that is linked to the work we do in survival um, and, and is that uh, we, we work also with what we call the uncontacted tribes that in our view are the most vulnerable people in the world. Uh, we are talking about uh, tribes that are not have any contact with the, any Pacific contact with the majority, with the mainstream society. And uh, because I, I, maybe we, we can talk later about is they don't have um, uh, the immunity uh, to face uh, diseases like that for us are not um, uh, terrible, like flu or misled. And, um, and they are living in the most biodiverse uh, places in the world. And this is something that we, we, we have to also to understand indigenous people live in the places that are more, they are the richest places in the world by resource and, bio, uh, and biodiversity. And that is uh, also a structural vulnerability because uh, of course they are living in these places where um, uh, rich and full of uh, resources. So uh, this also is linked to the land theft and the fact that a lot of people are trying to steal their land and stealing the resource. That's all. All right, thank you both for your stimulating and very informative opening statements. Um, Fiore, following up um, at the points you were already talking about, which coping mechanisms from indigenous groups that you know of are especially effective against the threats and negative impacts you were just talking about? Well, yes, as Joan was saying too, we don't have to forget that the history of indigenous people is a history of resistance to negative impacts. Uh, they have been facing uh, invasion, genocide, diseases uh, that brought by uh, by the colonization uh, since uh, the beginning of times. We we actually we can't talk about indigenous people without talking about resistance, without talking about um, how how they have been coping with all of this. Uh, they adapted successfully to uh, challenge and changes. And 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 for example, uh, in in Colombia um, where I work. Um, the, 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 the indigenous movement, as we know it today in Latin America, actually born in, in El Cauca, in El Valle del Cauca, and, and they uh, have been, um, so they created this movement and they, they uh, that had an enormous impact, for example, in Colombia politics and in the constitution that today recognized something that was revolutionary at that time, which is the common ownership of their territories. What I think that is the main coping mechanism of, of, of indigenous people is uh, the self-sufficiency. 
uh, most indigenous people, when they can, when they're allowed and, and they have the right to do it, are self-sufficient. That means they don't need to buy, uh, they don't depend on external goods, they don't need to buy um, things from outside. And we can see these, uh, 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 and, these and another uh, coping mechanism, which is the, the, the importance of the community and the social values. We can see how successful it is now, for example, in the pandemic, in the, in the, in, during this, in the coronavirus epidemic. Uh, because for the indigenous people that have access to their land, so they can they can um, they can isolate themselves and 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 they um, they can actually cope very well. Uh, of course, if they have access to land, I repeat, because if they don't have, uh, that's another story. Uh, they are the best conservationists and the best guardians of the natural world, and uh, so uh, they they have this very powerful and important knowledge that is another of these amazing coping mechanisms. Um, they know everything about their own environment, every flower, every stone, every leaf. Uh, they have this vast botanical and zoological and unique understanding of their, of their territories. And this is, of course, very important. And we can see it, uh, for example, um, we, we, we talk a lot about climate change and, and what is going on, but of course, uh, they are living in one in the places where they are the most exposed to the, the climate change and global warming. And they realized this a long time ago before our scientific knowledge uh, said that it was true. And, and they have been putting in place a lot of techniques, like, for example, the cultural burning, uh, or we call burning the little fires to control um, the, the big fires. For example, we, we can see what happened in Australia. Uh, now that this kind of fire is forbidden. Uh, so um, this enormous knowledge of the environment and the self-sufficient uh, and, and the social values they have are uh, the main um, elements that allow them and uh, have allowed them to uh, cope with uh, challenge and with changes in, in the history. All right. Yeah, you were mentioning a lot of points we will address uh, further in our discussion already. Um, it's great. So, Joan, do you like to add some something to the coping mechanisms um, of indigenous peoples? Yes, um, the, I, I think the core coping mechanism of indigenous peoples to begin with is our defense and protection of our lands and resources. Uh, because of uh, and and that's because the disasters are, are are also brought by the from the outside when 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 they take out our our, our resources that that's when uh, we cannot manage already changes in in our environment so that's one and and also that uh, that we uh, we protect we make use of our own governance system because that's the collective way of, of how we manage our resources to meet our needs and also the use of our uh, indigenous knowledge and, and innovations and strengthening our uh, cooperation and collective uh, ways of simple living. These are interrelated uh, el elements of, of, of uh, uh, our coping mechanisms and, and, and the, it, it comes with the values and principles uh, that guides how we should be working together to maintain and manage our, our lands and, and, and resources that will also ensure our survival and development as, as, as peoples and making use of our indigenous knowledge and innovations and, and building up our, uh, as mentioned earlier, our self-reliance uh, and, and our own uh, path for development. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right. Yeah, thank you um, for your remarks that illustrate already the livelihoods of some indigenous peoples um, and the current pandemic we are all knowing about um, bring a whole new factor that stresses indigenous peoples into the discussion. And uh, for this topic, I'd like to hand over to Paul who explores it a bit more detail. Thank you. Um, as Sabrina just said, and as Fiora and Joanne have brought up, um, that there are issues already for indigenous peoples and certain threats from the outside world. And now the pandemic situation adds a whole new stress level on top of that. And it demands our intention worldwide. So as you have seen in the introduction video, we have talked with indigenous peoples 
and their representatives and their current situations. And I would like to point out two of their examples to illustrate it a little bit more. For one, Jasmine Niosh, um, who unfortunately wasn't in the video, but she's a First Nation, she's a member of the First Nation peoples of the Menominee who are living in the United States. Um, and she says that the Menominee are usually very social uh, and the lockdown that is enforced upon them or that they have enforced upon themselves uh, interferes with this. But they can only enforce this lockdown for their own. They cannot isolate themselves from outside communities. And this is especially difficult for them as the Menominee are from a health perspective, especially vulnerable. Um, and these outsiders go back and forth inside and outside their communities um, and are at the potential of transmitting the virus. Um, Simon Peter Longoli from the Karamojong in East Uganda, who we saw in the video said that the Karamojong are subject to very strict isolation um, regulations. Uh, for example, their markets have been closed down and this is usually their own their only possibility and channel of income, which is therefore very um, critical for them. And he says that since Uganda is not as densely populated as most Western societies, he proposes that social distancing is not the right way to proceed there. He rather asks, asks for a more open economy for the people to be able to self-sustain themselves. So Ms. Carling, I would like, or Joanne, I would like to ask you, how is the lockdown uh, influencing other indigenous communities, some that you have worked with, some that you have heard of? And is social distancing the right measure or are there more appropriate ones? Yeah, I, I, I think the, the, as, 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 as you mentioned and uh, also mentioned by others, uh, community lockdown or community collective isolation has always been a common action of indigenous peoples to prevent the spread of, of diseases. Uh, and in, in some areas, like even in, in, in the Amazon, for example, once a disease reaches the community, the way they want to deal is they disperse themselves in the forest uh, by families or, you know, so that they don't contaminate it, each other. But this, this community lockdown has certain requirements or enabling environment for it to work as, a, as a, like a self-imposed community lockdown. So they know, for example, that they have to have enough food supply when they do that so that they don't starve uh, when they do the community uh, lockdown and, and that they can still continue with some of their livelihood activities precisely because they need to, to be self-reliant when they do a lockdown. So in, 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 in the self-imposed community lockdown of indigenous peoples, that works for them, uh, especially in the context that they have done the necessary uh, preparations. And, and you, we can see this, for example, in some communities in, in Indonesia, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the Philippines, for example, or even in Nepal, where, where these community uh, lockdowns are, uh, have taken place as self-imposed. And, and what they've done is also, since it's a self-imposed lockdown, they also make sure that there is no entry of other people in their village that can possibly bring the virus. So in India, for example, the, uh, the members of the villagers that are coming back, coming from cities or, or town centers, they have established like a quarantine zone outside the village. So those coming from the outside that are members of the village are put in the quarantine zone. They're provided with food, et cetera, to make sure that they, they take off and they are fed with nutritious food to build their resistance or, 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 or their immunity. And then after uh, some time, uh, normally two weeks or more, then they are allowed to go in the village, but they still observe um, quarantine within their house, not to circulate with others, but just confine themselves in their house. So that means they are, um, they are preventing any kind of spread. So, 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 uh, so this kind of community lockdowns are, are working in preventing the entry of virus in, into their uh, uh, villages. It's quite different when, uh, when you're also, and, and in that sense, social distancing is not actually uh, required because nobody's infected. 
right? They, 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 can, uh, they can circulate, they can do their livelihoods as long as there is no case amongst them. Mm -hmm. So social distancing does not, is, is not observed in, in, in that sense, except for those that are in quarantine. Uh, so, so that works. Now the social distancing is, is really difficult if you're outside the village, those that are in urban areas or town centers and mixed with others. Uh, it's difficult for them to observe that if they don't have enough food to, uh, to sustain themselves and they, they, uh, and, and they cannot just be in isolation and not, you, know, you, you know what I'm, that they don't, uh, there has to be a way for them uh, to get what they need uh, to be able to, to, to do social distancing. And we've seen this as a big problem when people does not have anything to eat if you don't have anything to eat, like in, in the case of Africa, they have to go to the market to sell their products so that they can buy food, but they're not allowed to order social distancing and other requirements like the use of masks, that they're required to use masks, they're not allowed to go in this area where they sell their crops because they have to have social distancing, then that prevents uh, the, their, their, uh, their livelihood. So. Uh, and, and one thing that, uh, for example, uh, came, came out also as part of the social is the use of masks where they have to buy masks and they don't have the money to buy masks, but yeah. it's, it's, it becomes a requirement. Yeah. So I've seen photos of, of people from, uh, from Cameroon and DRC using uh, banana leaves as masks. So yeah. just to comply, because otherwise they will be arrested and, and, and put to jail. No, so so that's that's that's. Uh, if I may, if I may uh, interrupt you at this point. <laughs> so yeah. to to sum up a little bit, uh, you're saying that it's not the right way to go forward to enforce the measures, but rather have some form of self isolation on on their own terms uh, with the necessary support from the government to prevent the spread, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, Ms. And and uh, the, the yes. No, oh, it's 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 also to emphasize the need of of support, like for example, uh, access to clean water and access to health services in case uh, those that are infected they they have to also have access to uh, health services. Okay, thank you, thank you for illustrating that that point with many many different examples from the field. Um, Fiore, would you like to add anything on on this question? Uh, no, no, I think it, she, it was, uh, well, the same thing that, uh, the same information we are getting from the field is exactly as, as John was saying. So we have one part, I think the main thing to say, it's very important to understand that it's, um, the, the way, uh, indigenous people are going to face, uh, this epidemic is linked to the right of the land. I mean, if they have right to the land, if they are able to isolate them in security, um, it's going to be, or it is going fine. For example, the uncontacted tribes should be the safest um, communities in the world. But of course, when they don't have the possibility to isolate themselves or when they have, uh, they need, uh, they are dependent on um, daily wage to live, for example, because they, uh, they are, uh, they, they, they not have self-sufficiency. Um, uh, the, what the government is, uh, the, the isolation can be dramatic because they can't work and they will not have um, money to eat food and to buy food, uh, as Joan was saying. So I think that it's important to make this, this difference. Um, they have uh, the access to their land and they have the right to, to isolate. Uh, they, they, of course, they're going to cope well and they're going to put in place all the mission they have always been doing to defend themselves from outside. But mm. if they don't have the right, it, it, it's, it's going to be catastrophic. Okay, thank you for, for expanding um, with the topic of the, of the land resources. Um, so as it seems that we, or the two of you are agreeing that governments should support indigenous peoples, um, but not enforce regulars, regulations upon them that don't fit their lifestyles. Um, let's say they would do that. Um, the my question, my next question would be, how is international development cooperation involved uh, at, this, at this stage of the pandemic, Fiore? Yes, well, uh, I, I think there is um, 
a, a big problem um, because uh, the, the way, well, there is a, in general a big problem with international development uh, cooperation and the way they are they're doing the thing. Uh, but uh, we can talk that, about that later. Uh, I think that um, what there, there is a very dangerous tendency in this moment, uh, which is um, that I have been noticing in, and even in the BMZ, in the German government, um, uh, they are claiming uh, a ban of uh, hunting and a ban of uh, wildlife consumption uh, because uh, linked to the, 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 the spread of the epidemic. And I think that is a very important thing to say because for a lot of people and a lot of indigenous people, but not only indigenous people in Africa and Asia, hunting meat or bush meat is a main source of identity and of food. And, and so I think that before um, the, the risk is that um, because of the crisis, the crisis is used to uh, enforce a vision of the world and a vision of development uh, that is um, very dangerous for indigenous people. So, um, and, and also uh, this is giving a lot of power to the government and uh, well, international development cooperation is part of also the government policies. Uh, they are a lot of governments are using uh, this uh, epidemic to um, pass laws and policies that are um, that are actually uh, about controlling uh, indigenous people's land. Using, of course, as I was saying, the epidemic as an excuse. Uh, there has been a, a lot of um, uh, outcry about the fact that we need more protected areas, for example, uh, because the epidemic um, apparently is linked to biodiversity loss. Uh, so um, uh, all of this is very dangerous because protect, the way that protected areas has been uh, done in, in, in the world has been, um, they have been done with a colonialist model. And so uh, ex um, evicting indigenous people that were living in this land. So I think that whatever uh, measure is taken what, by the government or put in place by the international cooperation, we should be first doing a very important operation of decolonizing the way we are doing it. Um, because what it could work for us is not always the, the, the best thing for indigenous people. And it's very important at this stage that we, um, I mean, talk with them. And as, as John was saying, they have been dealing with challenge and diseases since the entire, uh, the, the entire existence. And, and so they are the best place to see, also explain what there are their needs. And what are, what are their problems? Because not, not all indigenous people are the same. As we were saying, the people living in the city might have problems coping with the fact that they uh, need to work to survive. So they, they, the lockdown means that they can't have uh, money to buy their food. But it's not the same problem that indigenous people living with the right to the land, living in their forest have, which they need just to be live in peace. And, and, and they know how to self-isolate and they, have, they are self-sufficient. So I think that it's important that we don't, what the risk is with is the risk of all international development cooperation projects is that we generalize and we write projects and uh, base it on the ideas that we have about what it should be done without involving the communities and, and, and the indigenous knowledge. Thank you. That is a very, a very important message or a very important news about the current situation. Um, Going hand in hand with this, I would like to address the following questions to the both of you, Joanne and Fior. Um, we've now heard many examples where or how indigenous people usually cope with stress from the outside world um, and also how they cope with a pandemic context. But now uh, there's stress from governments and from development cooperation that aims at changing their lives. Do you think their, um, their way of life will uh, change, will be changed in the long way in this, uh, under these regulations? Maybe you could start, Joanne. Um, I, I, I suppose you mean under the pandemic, right? Uh, yeah, but is also it, afterwards. Is, yeah, um, I, I think we're drawing a lot of, of lesson, I hope, uh, from, from this, uh, pandemic uh, because it, it, it shows that that the, the destruction of our environment is actually the one causing this kind of pandemic, the zoonotic, where this virus jumped from animal to, to human beings. And that is because we're destroying the habitats of these, these animals. Uh, so what that means, there's a need to protect 
uh, uh, the, the biodiversity. And, and the, the best uh, protection for the biodiversity is it's, uh, from indigenous peoples. It's in, in indigenous peoples' territories that we see uh, biodiversity flourished and protected. So, so I, I, I think that that has to be clearly understood uh, that the link between indigenous peoples and biodiversity protection uh, as a, a, a critical measure. And by doing so, we need to all, all ensure that indigenous peoples' rights over their lands and resources are, are, are provided so that they can continue taking care of, of, of biodiversity. Uh, so, so I, I, I think that's, that's an, um, that's, that should be clear as a for, as way forward uh, in making the, the necessary change. And part of that would then be acknowledging the, the roles and, and contributions of indigenous peoples in terms of sustainable use and management of, of resources along with the positive values of uh, of taking care of the reciprocal relations between man and nature, that, that uh, we are interdependent and we cannot abuse uh, our environment or, or, or use them unsustainably. Uh, uh, so so that, that, that should again figure out. Another is the value of uh, solidarity and cooperation. We need solidarity and cooperation in spite of our diversity, because we have to rely on each, each, each other uh, in solving this kind of, uh, of uh, situation. And I, I think the uh, development cooperation should emphasize uh, how this is being embedded in development cooperation, of which those that the rights holders are, are, are being protected under this um, uh, kind of, uh, of, of uh, situation. So uh, uh, ju just to just to say that the the change that we have that has to happen will have to be driven uh, by by states and other development uh, actors because they are the ones making policies they are the ones enforcing policies and if they don't do the right policies if they don't make it under a, a rights based approach and a holistic approach to sustainable. Uh, development and management of, of resources, if they don't put uh, indigenous peoples and other rights holders at the center, as, the, as in the driving seat, addressing this kind of, of situation, we will not be able to, to uh, 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 overcome uh, this kind of, of pandemics and unsustainable uh, development. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, um, putting them in the driving driver's seat goes hand in hand with the with the title of our discussion today of making them the agents of change. Uh, I would like to hear what Fior has to think about um, or is is thinking about the question of um, the future change of indigenous people's ways of life, even after the pandemic? Well, I think that is a question that we could ask also to um, ourselves. I mean, as not indigenous person, is this pandemic it will change anything of a way of life? Well, um, <clears throat> so uh, it depends. Um, it's probably uh, like in, in our society, I don't think actually this is going to change really your way of life as uh, it, it, it can give us um, but at the same time, it gives us a lot of material to think about what uh, the, the, what means for us life, what is meaningful for us. Uh, but I don't think it's going to really change their way of life. And I think that what it's important, again, is repeat that this is not the first epidemic they are facing. This is not the first time indigenous people have challenged. Their story is a story of resistance. And, and, and well, if we think about colonization, um, that's well the first, the first thing. But I also think about the fact that when survival was created in 1969, um, it was created by a group of, of people in London because they were very concerned about the extinction of uh, the annihilation of indigenous people. That was in the 69. And today, uh, so uh, more than 50 years after, um, indigenous people are still there um, and they're still, of course, uh, surviving and having an extraordinary way of life. Uh, I think that it's also important to remember that change is part of um, 
indigenous peoples as it's part of all societies, not that they are frozen in the past and they live exactly as uh, they were living a long time ago. They are as us and they are changing. So the, the, the current situation could change and could have an impact in the way of life in the exactly way that it's going to have an impact or you can have an impact in our way of life. Um, and uh, what if this impact is going to be positive or negative, it depends a lot of, uh, as Joan was saying, in what the governments are going to do. Because if uh, we use this pandemic to uh, have much more control of the state over indigenous people land, or if they use this uh, epidemic to ban the wildlife consumption, uh, this of course can have a terrible impact on indigenous people land. Uh, but uh, at, at the same time, uh, well, for example, the absence of government, which mostly all the attention in South America of the government is given now to the cities, so what is going on to the cities. So this is opening uh, the lands of indigenous people to invade invasions of uh, loggers and miners, especially in South America. Uh, so, of course, it is people uh, are going inside the territory of indigenous people and they are invading their land that can, of course, have a terrible impact uh, in their in, in the future. So I think that uh, unfortunately I don't have like a, a reply, like a, a, reply um, um, a statement about this. I, I think that most of what is going to happen is depend uh, on uh, government policies um, and how they, this is going to be embraced by, I mean, what kind of, of, of policy the government is going to put in place and how they are going to react to that. Uh, but I have doubt that indigenous people will um, cope with it uh, in the best way they can as they have always done. And I think it's very important to not forget that change and resistance are part of indigenous people's life and they have always been. Mm -hmm. Thank you for um, rounding off your statement so, so perfectly to go hand in hand with our transition to the next um, topic of our discussion. So um, we have just heard several coping strategies that indigenous people apply or would like to apply if they had the power to. Um, but we just see a general lack of inclusion of their strategies in government regulations or international cooperation. For example, um, the examples we have heard in the introduction video, the Mapuche were, were forced to change their agriculture by the Green Revolution. Uh, the Udege are at risk of losing their forest and the Sherpas of Nepal cannot teach their children about their way of life in a more and more westernized education system. So the next part of the discussion will focus um, on indigenous knowledge and international cooperation and government regulations. But um, before hand handing back over to Sabrina, I would like to remind the listeners um, that are watching um, of, the pol uh, of, the pol of the possibility to hand in your questions to our experts with the Q&A function. So if you have anything on your mind that's um, burning, um, please address the respective expert and forward it in the Q&A function. But now over to Sabrina. Well, all right. Um, Fiore, you already and both of you already mentioned um, about um, development cooperation and the inclusion of indigenous knowledge. But again, I would like to emphasize and ask for why indigenous knowledge of, is often not included or even ignored in development approaches and projects. And um, do you think there have been any attempts to integrate this knowledge um, into the projects? Uh, well, why is not included? That is a very interesting question. And I think it's because of racism. It's because of our colonial way of uh, doing, uh, doing development and doing uh, projects. Uh, um, we think we know better. And, and, and there is this very um, interesting idea um, of, um, of the fact, it's not only that, that it mostly, even when not clearly manifest, uh, a lot of projects are based on the idea that, they, that we are talking about primitives, a little bit like a uh, social Darwinist idea of development. So uh, we are modern, we Western societies are modern, and we need to bring modernity and development uh, to uh, those communities. So mostly I think that that's one of the reasons why this, uh, the knowledge is not included. I think it's very important to decolonize the idea of development. What actually development means when we say um, we, um, we are doing a development project, and, but what development means, what kind of change we want to bring to other people, 
do that people really need that change of it's it's do they what we are doing is really what they need or uh or what we need and how we see society and i think um, that there are there are a lot of attempts on paper to integrate indigenous people knowledge, but uh, on paper and on theory because it sounds so great and amazing. But then when the projects are run and the way the projects are actually written, uh, if, since um, I, I don't know if our audience has experience about what what a development project means, but it it's, there is a logical framework and there are indicators uh, and there are uh, actions and goals and the entire language. The entire narrative of project development is actually very, very ethnocentric. It's very colonialist. It's based on the idea that we know better and it's based on the idea that scientific knowledge is uh, the only knowledge that is um, uh, it's good and, and, and it's legitimate. Um, so I can see that, for example, a lot in, in the conservation project uh, where um, there is a lot of, uh, which it actually it's, it's, it's a kind of development approach and, and we, uh, in our Western societies, we think that we know how to protect the environment. Um, and we write this um, project saying that, yes, we should include indigenous knowledge. Of course, everything on paper sounds great. But then when we go to, uh, for example, uh, a lot of places in Africa, uh, we impose this idea that to protect nature, we need to uh, create protected areas, so exclude indigenous people from inside, because hunting is something bad, because uh, bear, like, uh, cultural burning or uh, burning agriculture, uh, sorry, uh, rotation agriculture is something bad. And, and so this idea that we have created without acknowledging that those environments are not empty, are not forests, are not wild, had this, uh, those environments have been shaped and managed by indigenous people for generations. Um, I think that that the reason why uh, we're not including this kind of of, of thing it's, it's so obvious that 80 percent of biodiversity is, is indigenous people territory they know how to manage this environment so i always ask myself why we're not including their knowledge in 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 our project why we are thinking we know better and i think that unfortunately the only um, answer is because of racism because even when we are not thinking uh, that we are racists there is a very important and deep and in root racism and structural racism and discrimination in the way we interact with indigenous people. And I think that the main thing uh, to do is to try to acknowledge that and to try to decolonize the way um, we, um, we think and we uh, impose development. All right, yeah. Thank you for, for these remarks. Uh, maybe, John, you like to... Um... Maybe, or I would just would just give the answer uh, the question to to one of you. Um, do you see concrete steps to include indigenous knowledge in um, projects, or um, how would you how would you say, Joan, if you could answer? Um, uh, yes, there are efforts to do this, but in in a way that we need to, as mentioned earlier, decolonize our thinking of of development. Because I think that's where the problem uh, starts when we think of, of a Western development and thereby there is already an inherent contradiction between uh, the, the values uh, embedded in indigenous knowledge and the development, uh, the Western development approaches. Uh, for example, like uh, um, what I can give as an example of integrating traditional knowledge is on sustainable agricultural development that is uh, based on or organic farming on a small scale, and in in the development context, that is uh, that is uh, that is backward. That is considered backward and not commercial, because the value that is embedded in that kind of Western development thinking is it has to be commercial, large scale, and then it's 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 driven by uh, the commercial value and not sustainability. So, so there's already that inherent uh, contradiction of where traditional knowledge is in embedded. So the, for example, it's embedded with the uh, sustainability, self-reliance, small-scale uh, production, uh, resilience. Those are not the values of an economic system that defines what development is. Uh, so, so, it, so if, like, say. Uh, we can see even, for example, in terms of forest management, no? indigenous peoples are using timber for their houses, for whatever they need, and they're managing it well, right? 
but that is not seen as good uh, forest management uh, system. Now it's changing with, uh, uh, with already some uh, uh, good practices of partnership where the indigenous uh, practices of forest management are, are, are the ones that is being implemented as part already of uh, forest uh, conservation and, 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 and management uh, measures. But, but this has to be within the context of respecting and protecting, again, the rights of indigenous peoples, the, our right to practice our traditional knowledge, our right to strengthen our indigenous institutions, and, and uh, intervention from the outside is, 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 uh, is minimal, minimal if, uh, and it has to abide by what the, the community set uh, as their own regulations. Otherwise, it will be an artificial and it, it's not, and, and the use of, 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 of indigenous knowledge is not linked to ensuring that there is respect and protection of the rights of indigenous peoples, but taking it out of the context and, and applying it in another context uh, that, 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 that divorces indigenous peoples from their own knowledge. All right, thank you, Ms. Uh, Joan. Um, from another perspective, I'd just like to go to an, an example from one of our interviewees, um, Pedro Conya Canyoyan. He's from the Mapuche community in Chile, and he illustrated to us about an incident um, within this community. There's a bamboo-like plant called Chila, and that plant doesn't flower regularly. Last year, Mr. Konya Kanyoyan reported that the plant flowered. For the Mapuche, it is an important sign, a message that scarcity, famine, or difficult times are coming, and people began to prepare for this difficult moment. Mr. Konya Kanyoyan said, the communities have their knowledge, and if one observes well, you can know, because nature always warns first. Fiore, since you worked with the Mapuche communities in Chile, how does one measure these culture or similar cultural practices? And how is it possible to implement this knowledge in modern or Western society? Well, uh, actually, I, I think it's really difficult to implement this kind of knowledge. Um, I, I have been working with the Mapuche, especially with them, medicinal power about medicinal plants and how they were um uh, how the the, the, co the the cooperation between the health the public healthcare system and their um, what is called traditional medicine and uh it's very interesting because we think that uh they're opposite that uh the mapuche would say well they're not opposite every disease has their own way of you can deal with every different different disease in different ways so western what they call western disease like for example hypertension they they did they don't have a medicinal plant in their in to to deal with that because it's a it's a foreign it's something that has been um implement uh, brought by the colonization according to them so um they they would not have the plant, the medicinal plant to deal with that but they will they will have their own medicinal plant for other and they will respect uh, the, the, the Western or the public healthcare system in the same way that they respect their own medicine. So the, 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 the problem is, so for, for them, it's very simple. Uh, it's, it's not, nothing is opposite. You, you could have both. The problem, I think, is the way we are doing the things. And, and it's, it's, it's not, it's not um, actually difficult in practice to integrate and consider indigenous people knowledge but it is very difficult because what we are talking about, because we need to decolonize the way we are doing development and what we think about development. If uh, we should be considering indigenous people, key partners and experts in their own things, it's, it's um, in, their, in, the, in the manager of their own environment, uh, in, the, in the manager of the, uh, of the, the medicine, we should understand that they have their own kind of medicine and, and, and their own kind of food and their own kind of social values. And that a lot of, of the, things that we are using today as a medicine or as a other products comes from indigenous people knowledge. Instead, most of pro development projects consider indigenous people beneficiaries of their project or nuisance to be dealt with. And so, uh, and, 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 and not as a key partner. And I think that that is the, is the more important thing is like, if we don't acknowledge uh, that, uh, that, that there has been a historical injustice in our relationship with indigenous people, 
that uh, development cooperation is not neutral. It, it is part of a vision of a government who, and, and it's part of a, also a colonial model of doing things. And if we had, don't acknowledge this, it's impossible to integrate anything in our, in our project. Um, so I, I think that the main thing, as I was saying, is not really very difficult to do in practice. And this, again, indigenous people teach us that. Uh, that we need to, uh, to, to really decolonize our thoughts and the way uh, we, we, we are doing um, uh, international cooperation and uh, also understand that without the colonial uh, context, without the colonial framework, without understanding the asymmetry of relationships uh, that we have been cre we created, uh, it's impossible to, to have any kind of real cooperation and real um, relationship with uh, indigenous people. Great. Thank you for your thoughts. And time is unfortunately uh, running out. So thank you both experts for your views and um, all these interesting thoughts you were sharing with us. So now we would like to open the virtual floor to our listeners and the questions they have because they cannot come too short. So by selecting the most popular questions you have sent to us via Zoom chat, we um, will have a look at these and Moritz will guide you through the questions. Yeah, thank you, Sabrina, and a warm welcome also from my side to all um, active and passive participants of this webinar. Indeed, our listeners have been very active during the event. Numerous questions have been posted and rated, so we should now have a look at the questions that are considered the most pressing ones according to our audience. And we will work our way through from the top downwards, addressing as many questions as the time allows. So let's jump right into it. The first question is not addressed to a single speaker, so I just want to give it into the digital podium. Maybe Ms. Longo, you start. So the question is, which advantages offers digitalization in maintaining the complexity and approaches and practices of indigenous peoples? Are there good examples? Are there best practices? Of digitalization. Exactly. Okay. Yes, uh, it's. It, I think that, that it's, it's a very interesting question, uh, again, linked to this idea of change we have of indigenous people, because as I was saying, they change as everyone of us, they are or contemporaries, they are contemporary society, so they have introduced uh, themselves also a lot of um, uh, digital, digital tools. Um, and the, the main, the key is that we are talking about uh, communities that mostly are invisible for the state, or they have been uh, subjected to an invisibilization process. So uh, the, the, the access to, uh, for example, um, internet or the fact that they have smartphones can actually be a very good tool to communicate with outside and to uh, spread uh, the world and say what, what, what they're facing. And for example, uh, we in survival have um, a project called Tribal Voice, uh, which is actually consists in bringing uh, technology um, um, uh, the technology nece necessary to um, uh, record the video or record um, also, well, uh, yes, or taking pictures to uh, communities so that they can um, um, just uh, s speak out about what is going on, but not only in from a negative perspective, also to show to uh, our societies how they way of lives are um, extraordinary, diverse, and and full of. Uh, incredible uh, social values and knowledge and uh, it's it's a platform um, so it, it we we do both we bring them uh, the, the, the necessary technology but it's also a web platform in which they can speak to the world and and we put out um, I invite you everyone to to go to see because we we have these uh, short videos one minute videos of indigenous people from all around the world uh, they, it's very easy uh, how it, it works so they just send us a video by whatsapp or and, and then we, we can upload it. And I think that this is, is, is a very, well, it's a good practice because it shows, as I was saying, the extraordinary diversity of indigenous people from all around the world. It's very easy, it's very quick, but it's also um, not only to tell negative things about the violence or the, the abuses they're facing, but also to show very positive and daily life things. Um, so I think that that, that, that that could be, a, I would consider that a good practice of how technology and digitalization can help uh, to show, um, so yes, to highlight their problems, and, and that is important because, of course, uh, without knowing what is going on, uh, we can't really um, stop the abuses, but at the same time, it, it can be very positive 
uh, because it shows us uh, that their uh, indigenous people are not uh, frozen in the time, they are our contemporaries and, and, uh, us, and they change us exactly like us. All right. That sounds very interesting. Uh, maybe, uh, Ms. Carling, do you want to add something? Do you have uh, your own opinion, examples, uh, best practices? Yeah, uh, uh, the, the best practice has already mentioned. I just want to add a, a bit of a concern on because it's a, it's a uh, double edge. Uh, it can also be used to, uh, for misinformation Uh, and also raising security risks to uh, activists. Uh, like now, for example, my, my colleagues in the Philippines uh, are being uh, demonized in, in Facebook and, and social media because of the, the work they're doing in defending indigenous people's uh, rights. Uh, and that is using the, the digital world. And another one that is now coming up as, as, as a concern is that uh, some indigenous youth are heavily already just used, excessively using uh, the digital platform and already getting the link uh, from their communities or even in the, on the issue of uh, uh, the transmission of traditional knowledge. Although, of course, we can use the digital platform also as a means for uh, the transmission of, of traditional knowledge, it can also distract the, 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 the what's this, um, the best way on, on how to do that uh, in terms of being in, 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 in indigenous territories. And let's not forget that majority of indigenous peoples are not in the digital world. So there's still that divide. Yeah. yeah, a nice critical elaboration. Um, the next question, um, is also addressed to both of you. Um, in your opinion, maybe this time Ms. Carling can start. In your opinion, is development cooperation fundamentally possible without implementing a normative Western view of the world? Uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's possible under uh, certain uh, contexts and requirements. And, and, and for me, Uh, one is that, that uh, it, it should always be based on respect for, for human rights, that it needs to protect human rights as, 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 as a starting point. It has to uphold accountability, social justice, and, and promote uh, equality. Because without operationalizing these principles, which is the current situation largely, It's, 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 uh, it's just uh, supporting further the very oppressive political and economic system that is causing uh, uh, practically uh, the ethnocide of indigenous peoples. It's, it's helping that system. Uh, so we need to, to reorient uh, the kind of development uh, cooperation, which in, to some extent is, is, is already uh, making that change. But for indigenous peoples, it's, it's really important to Uh, to, to relate with indigenous peoples on the basis of respecting our distinctness, our dignity, our well-being, the way we perceive the world and, and the way we manage our resources, our perceptions and our values. Because if that is not respected, then it's, it's just going to cause not just development, but division uh, amongst us and conflicts. Uh, amongst indigenous uh, peoples and, and the continuing destruction of our uh, environment. But, but I, I, I think there are principles that we can stand by and implement uh, to make development cooperation work. And, uh, and, and, and I think as long as there is good faith and, and goodwill to really show uh, this kind of, uh, that there is political will to, to change that, and, and then I think we can go, go a long way. Yeah, very interesting point made here. Um, Ms. Longo, you also want to contribute or share your ideas? Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, I think that I, of course, I think also it's possible. Otherwise, I, I wouldn't be doing this work if I uh, <laughs> didn't think that it was really possible to change the way we think. Um, and I always give, I will just give you an example of the campaign I work in, which is the conservation campaign. So to try to decolonize the way we, we are we think we should be protecting the nature because when we start the campaign um for well for like four years ago we really start campaigning about it 
no one was thinking, I mean, no one in the Western world was thinking that conservation was something good. You know, we are protecting nature. What, what is wrong in this? And, and um, well, indigenous people know since the beginning that con the way that conservation it has been done, it's, it was co as colonialist and all other kind of things, and that they have been excluded from the land to create national parks. Uh, but um, so when we start talking about this, everyone was saying it's impossible. You know, we are just, conservation is something good. And now things are really start changing. Not, of course, um, um, in the way we would like to, uh, not as fast as we would like it, but of course things are changing. Now there is much more uh, acknowledgement of the fact that human rights are important also in conservation projects because conservation is not only about nature, that this idea of nature we have, it's completely um, made up and it has a history, a colonial history. And so I, I think that of course, of course it's possible, but it requires, but as we, we have been saying, a very important change in public opinion and in the way we, we think and we do believe, uh, we, we, we do and we relate to indigenous people. And, and I think that that change can happen. You know, a long time ago, slavery was considered something normal. And, and now it's considered what it is, uh, something terrible. And uh, so I, I do believe that we, we, can, we can move forward and we can do that change, but it requires a lot of time. And, and it requires a lot of attention about, of course, again, how, what, the language we use uh, and, and the, the narrative, uh, we, 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 in, in the narrative in which we frame things, and it, it requires a lot of attention. We have to pay attention about uh, the way we, we write projects and we talk about things. All right. Um, also, the next question is addressed uh, to you, Ms. Longo. Um, mm -hmm. And it is uh, with regard to the Sendai framework, we have heard that indigenous people's knowledge should be used to complement scientific knowledge and users find this expression uh, quite critical. What is your opinion on that? Sorry, can you repeat the first? Uh, yes, I, with regard yeah. to the Sendai framework. Yes. Um, indigenous people's knowledge should yes. be used to complement. So it's mm -hmm. about the wording, I guess, complementing scientific knowledge. The mm, yeah. finds this expression quite critical and is keen yeah. on hearing your opinion. Yes, uh, yes, I understand why uh, he find that or she find that um, uh, critical. I, I think. Uh, that it's not about being complimented. I think that we should uh, talk about sym asymmetry of power uh, and we should understand that it's not, it's, it's, of course, they, they could be complemented in a certain way, uh, but uh, it, it has to be put in the same, um, in, in the same uh, frame, I, I mean, in the same level. I think that there is this kind of problem, um, usually that we think uh, we, we, we are, so we have our knowledge, scientific knowledge that is the only knowledge, and then we incorporate other like indigenous people knowledge can be useful in some context. And we don't understand that we should put this in the same level. They are not, um, two, dif there are not two different things. Um, they, they are, this, it, well, there are two different things, but it's just another kind of, no, it's another view, another way of seeing the world that is exactly as legitimate as our vision. And, and, and uh, science is not um, truth. Science is product of a, 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 a certain paradigm, uh, a paradigm and a, a certain way of seeing the world. And it's not neutral. Science is also power, science is political. Um, and I, I think that, well, uh, there is a lot to say about that and Foucault and, and the way of, of philosophy and the way we see about things. But I, I think that independently of this debate, it's very important to understand that scientific knowledge and, and indigenous knowledge uh, were both products of societies, not all knowledge that is the knowledge that is product of culture and then all knowledge that is, is the truth. They're both product of our society. So behind scientific knowledge, there are also political struggles. There is also a view of the world. And, and I think that is, it, it's important to understand that independently of talking about if they are com uh, complementary or not. All right, um, we are running out of time. I would uh, really like to hear more audience questions, but with a look at the watch, we have to continue. Um, thank you, Ms. Carling and Ms. Longo for hearing out and answering the questions from the audience. I guess we could go on and on. Um, of course, we also want to thank our audience for the numerous questions and the vast interest. If your question was not asked so far, please feel free to check out the SLA Twitter page 
and keep the discussion running via Twitter. And well, that's it from my side. And I would like to hand over the moderation back to Sabrina. Yeah, thanks, Moritz. Uh, yeah, as we can see, there's a broad interest from the audience also on many topics uh, or many aspects of the topics of the topic. Um, but yeah, we we have to continue and we want to um, give the last words to you, both experts. Um, and we would like to know in a brief uh, statement about your concluding remarks and on the main points you want to emphasize on with regard to um, your work and how you would like to see indigenous knowledge and your work develop. Maybe, um, Joan, you could start. Yes, I, I just want to uh, mention what I have, I was not able to mention earlier uh, uh, in, in relation to, to pandemic. Uh, oh, there are two points that I want to, to mention here that the response measures of states uh, to the pandemic is uh, disproportionately affecting indigenous uh, peoples in the context of further criminalization and violation of, of rights of indigenous peoples, in, including killings, uh, just like what happened in, 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 in Colombia, arrests and detention, uh, and, and, uh, and ta te terrorist tagging. And also that because the, the, the virus is affecting more of the elders, it's actually going to pose a big threat to the transmission of indigenous knowledge. If we lose our elders because of the pandemic, if they will die from this virus, which is now happening in the Navajo state, states, which is now spreading all over Brazil, then you can Im imagine the loss of, of knowledge, not only the knowledge that, that, that is lost, but a generation uh, of, of, of uh, in indigenous peoples who are the, the, uh, the practitioners of traditional knowledge and our indigenous uh, system. So that, that's, that's the two points that I want to make on the pandemic uh, in relation also to traditional knowledge. And, and finally, on the, on the development uh, cooperation, uh, I just want to mention that um, from my observation and uh, interaction, there's a lot of support actually going to public health system, uh, supporting frontline defenders uh, uh, from development cooperation, which are of course needed but there is no clear measure on how this is also going to reach the, the furthest behind that needs those kind of support and assistance. Uh, for example, indigenous peoples that are infected, how are they going to have access? Are these monitored? Will there be, uh, be uh, 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 data disaggregation by ethnicity to monitor how far this, this problem and, and the actions are reaching uh, indigenous peoples. And more importantly, how is development cooperation ensuring that human rights uh, are protected, uh, particularly in relation to issue of land grabbing, protection of uh, uh, environment and land, uh, land rights uh, defenders, as well as uh, also the issue of, uh, of protection of women against violence. So these are critical issues of which I think development cooperation in supporting pandemic uh, should be anchored uh, to and, and should look into because what I observe is that again, a lot of this money is ending up in, in, uh, in corruption. There's no transparency. Uh, it's, it's also just uh, discrimination is, is happening. It's directed more to the, to who knows the, the government officials that are doing this. So, uh, and, and, and finally, uh, ju just to mention that when, when we're talking of uh, traditional knowledge, we need to always look at this in the context of protecting and respecting the rights of indigenous peoples as the knowledge holders, because without that protection, this knowledge is not going to prosper. This knowledge that is benefiting the whole world uh, will be in jeopardy. So if we want to protect indigenous knowledge, we need to protect those that are practicing this knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. I'm glad you could add your last uh, points on this topic for today. And um, Fiore, I'd like to ask you to give your last remarks for today's webinar. Yeah, thank you. Well, just <clears throat> uh, what Joan said was quite inspiring. So um, I, I, I feel a, li a little bit, uh, uh, it's very difficult to talk after her. 
But um, just uh, just would like to add uh, one thing about the fact that we, we, we have been talking about the pandemics, we have been talking about how does impact also our society and the loss of biodiversity and how um, you know, we, we are destroying the environment. And I, I think that, uh, so I just want to conclude to say that the reason why we are talking today about indigenous people is not only because of their human rights, which is of course the, the main, um, I mean, the, the, the heart of what we do in survival, uh, is to defend their, their human rights. It's not only about them. I think it's especially about us, about who we are as society and, and where we want to go. Um, uh, we don't have to forget that uh, we are talking about uh, the most diverse societies in the world and diversity is the most important treasure that we have as humanity. Uh, um, tribal peoples understand the natural world and they're expert conservationists. Uh, they have enlightened social values. They are not primitive, they're all contemporary. So in mo most of the cases, if you put community before the individual, they share and exchange possessions rather than among uh, personal wealth and they embrace gender equality. We have a lot of uh, things to learn from them, both to how to manage and to handle uh, crisis, uh, but especially um, a lot about who we are as, as human beings. So um, that is my uh, final remark. I, I think that we, we should all, all try to bring indigenous people at the heart uh, of, 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 of the international cooperation projects that we were talking about, uh, but in general of debates, um, also related to the climate change uh, uh, question as we were talking before. And, uh, not only in, in, I mean, not only tribal uh, indigenous people, but also diversity in general. That it. Thank you, Fiora, uh, and also thank you, Joanne, for your final contribution. The very many inspiring contributions to uh, today's panel discussion. Um, looking back at our event, we wanted to talk about indigenous peoples and their potential role in disaster risk management. So we first talked about the general vulnerabilities indigenous people face, which led us to the current pandemic situation with its lockdowns and social distancing and forced upon indigenous peoples. And finally, we discussed the possibility of how exactly indigenous people can gain a more significant status in their respective countries, uh, their respective government regulations and the development process as a whole so they can go from being left behind to really becoming agents of change and being in a driver's seat, as Joanne phrased it very fittingly. Um, granted, we only had 90 minutes and we only were able to shed light on some of the context topics, but um, I think we've encountered some very important points and <laughs> I think uh, Joanne and Fiora could uh, explain many more topics uh, for the rest of the day to us. Um, but for now, in the name of my group, I wanted to give thanks uh, to the both of you. Um, I, uh, sorry, uh, to both of you uh, for your participation and your contributions. And also my whole team and I, we would like to thank Heinrich Böll Stiftung and Info, who, who really support us in organizing this event. And also last but not least, um, I want to th say thank you to you, all the listeners out there um, who really contributed a lot to this event with your questions and your discussion. And I really encourage you to keep the discussion going on Twitter. Um, further information about the presented topic can be found in an SLA briefing paper, which will be published, uh, published uh, during the next couple of days. And if you would like to find out more about the work of Info, you might want to visit uh, infoe.de. And finally, may I remind you again that we would be very grateful if you could take the time to evaluate our event with the link in the chat. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.